and clicking the link in order to provide your feedback. In order for, in order to be able to do that, uh, you have to do it before 5 p.m. today. So please, as soon as you are done with the forum, go to your electronic devices and get into the link and provide your opinions about the candidates. Um, we are going to start, and we will, I want to welcome Dr. Mapamulu. Um, welcome to Fullerton College. And we are going to be passing back and forth this mic in order to avoid the feedback. So please, here it is, your mic. Thank you, Adele. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah? Well, what a full house. Uh, thank you for taking time today to come and uh, visit with me and uh, uh, get to understand some of my um, accomplishments and my leadership experience and the reason why I would like to be your president. Um, I always uh, uh, start my discussion with folks a uh, little bit about the community college system and my journey into the community college system by talking about the value and the need that we meet and the role that the community college system plays in the lives of many Americans. Um, I always like to preface my discussion about the community college system by talking about two things that are really the reason why I am part of the community college system. You know, we are in a political season and there is a lot of talk about the middle class vanishing there is a lot of talk about the American high education system not doing its job of producing high quality trained people. Um, but we are today the only institution in the United States that is an on-ramp and a gateway to the American dream and middle class life. We are the only institution in this land that is the equivalent of the Ellis Island of the 21st century for immigrant families and the American promise. Let me talk a little bit about why I think you, hire me, you have to hire me as your president. I started my journey as a faculty member I started teaching assessment and evaluation, you know, that dreaded assessment that we are talking about, SLOs and all, all those things. Then I became a department chair, and I became a dean, and I became a vice president at Bellevue Community College, which sits east of Seattle. And as a vice president at Bellevue Community College, I had the opportunity to work across both sides of the house, student services and instruction. And then I got the opportunity to be a president for Northern Virginia Community College in Virginia. Uh, my campus sat right, sits, it's still there, it didn't go with me, sits right behind the Pentagon. Virginia Community College is a multi-district, second largest multi-campus district, rather, after Miami-Dade Community College. And I had the opportunity as the president, of course, to marshal the resources and the talent of faculty, staff, and students to do some of the most promising transformative programs in terms of student success. But I'll stop there about my journey and my educational qualifications. Is this the time when I hand the mic for question? Well, let me talk a little bit more about myself. Um, you know, this is an outstanding institution, beautiful institution, a storied history, dedicated faculty, quality education, focus on student success, and a very tight community. One of the reasons I'm interested in becoming part of this extraordinary team 
is not only because I am qualified to be part of you, but it's because I've also done a lot of things. But it's also because I have participated in some of the most transformative efforts that have led to a number of successful student success programs. So let me just talk about a few of those uh, programs. Uh, when I was the president for the Alexandria campus, I was able to participate in a national effort, which was a community-based organization initiative that allowed communities, first-generation communities, and first-generation students to move into our programs. We created a pathway for those students so that they could take classes in the community, transition to NOVA, which was the name for Northern Virginia Community College. That program is in, currently in 121 colleges across the nation, has produced 15,000 graduates, currently has 9,000 students across the nation. I'm very proud of that. Um, I also participated, in fact, I was a co-founder of a program called Gateway to College, which is currently in 45 universities and colleges in 23 states. Gateway to College program allows high school students who are just about to graduate but they don't have enough credit to take high, high school courses as well as college courses at the same time and graduate with an AA degree. That program has served 15,000 students. In fact, our first institution that we trained was Riverside Community College. Enough about myself. Yes. First of all, I need to apologize for the electronic problems we are having. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to make the, the first question for you. You have four minutes. Describe, please describe your leadership style and identify three fundamental principles that reflect how you get things done in today's challenging environment and how would you inspire others to follow you? Thank you. I, uh, I subscribe into seventh leadership, and I know that's a, a kind of a word play on all these permutations of leadership, but my leadership is really based on three fundamental principles. One, transparency. People have to know what you do and how you're doing what it, whatever it is that you're supposed to do. Um, the second one is participative decision-making. Um, without a full-fledged participative style where you include people in the decision-making, you're not going to make it in a relation-based institution like ours here. Um, my third uh, principle is finding a way to empower people so that they are part of informing the quality of work that you do. Your, call, your question had multiple points. Let me see if I'm going to capture all of them. So three principles, transparency, inclusive decision-making style, and empowering people. Um, remind me, what was another part of your question? How did you include other people? How you make, make other people follow you? One of the ways that has worked for me in terms of including people in the decision making is to have an open door policy, first and foremost. My office is always open to faculty, staff, community members. And one of the reasons that's important is because when people don't have the opportunity to access you when they need to, then you are not really linking with them and you're not having the opportunity to hear the things that are important and meet their needs. Um, Another thing that I have done that has served me well is I have listening uh, every two weeks. I have listening arrangements where people come in. It's an open forum like this where people come in and they talk about the issues that are important to them. And they share with me things that are working and things that are not working. <clears throat> and of course, we have, we have our official shared 
governance structure, which is another mechanism by which people participate in helping inform me about what's going on. And it's also a platform for getting college communities to participate in the decision-making process. Another thing that has worked well for me in terms of inviting people and having the opportunity to hear from people is I invite through, I used to have a blog, but now I let it go. But I used to have a blog where people could post routinely issues and questions that they had or things that I could do better. Every year I send a request to college campuses, college communities rather, and I ask people to share with me five things that I'm doing well and five things that I could do better. So I, I and those are not just the only means, but I also make sure that when we have initiatives, which is one of the ways that has worked for me, when we have initiatives, for example, we are going through a very trying time with our SLOs, trying to get everyone on the same train, trying to make sure we are meeting ACCJC's requirement for assessing all our students and all the outcomes. And the way that I have approached that is to get, get people together and say, this is what we need to do. These are the outcomes that are needed. How are we going to work together to get these things done? I meet with my Senate, fac uh, Senate leadership and union leadership every two weeks. That is the opportunity where we talk about a lot of things and they give me feedback. I also run everything that I have in mind through those two groups before I even attempt to do it in the larger context. The, the second question is, please describe one or two specific strategies you initiated or facilitated to improve a student success. How did you measure the results? Uh, thank you. You know, I, I'm going to give you an example, one of the examples that I think is very instructional because of its uh, material importance to the college. When I got hired um, in 2013, we had just been, actually we had been on probation for three years. <clears throat> in fact, when I got hired, the president said, your most important, excuse me, your most important duty is to make sure that we get out of probation. Prior to my arrival, we had completed two follow-ups and none of them had been successful. We had nine recommendations altogether. I'm really proud about the fact that in a year and a half, I was able to get all the college communities together. I was able to get faculty and staff and develop a plan that eventually got us out of probation. And one of the reasons why I'm mentioning that as a student success related initiative is because, as you know, if you're not accredited, you can't provide quality educational opportunities to your students. Your concentration, your attention, your resources are all dedicated to getting accredited. You know how ACCJC is. <clears throat> so I'm really proud of that. But the most uh, proudful accomplishment in terms of student success is the initiative that we just uh, developed about a year ago. We were one of the recipients of the California uh, career Trust Pathway grant and we really received $15 million to lead a consortium of five colleges and 21 school districts. The essence of that program is to develop car five career pathways that allow students from high schools to transition to those five community colleges. We just started that initiative a year and a half ago. So far, we're very proud about the results that have come out of that initiative. We've already developed the pathways. We've already developed the curriculum for articulation for those pathways. And that's how really we are measuring our uh, success that, that thus far. Well, 
welcome. I'm Jennifer Combs. I'm the Fullerton College Campus Curriculum Chair. So as you might imagine, my question is, as the Fullerton College President, what is your role in curriculum? Well, I think my role is first and foremost, you know, I used to be a, a curriculum chair myself when I was a faculty member. I think the role of the president in the development of curriculum is really, is twofold, and maybe more, but twofold. Uh, make sure that the curriculum content and the program certificates and courses that are developed through the curriculum process receive support from the president. And secondly, I think one of the most important responsibilities for the president is to work with faculty to make sure that the courses, the certificates, and the diplomas we develop meet the needs of our students. And if it's career technical programs, that they meet the needs of our businesses and industries. And then providing support and guidance and being a cheerleader for the process. Good morning. My name is, oh. I don't think I need this, but good morning. My name is Linda Kelly Mandich, and I'm part of the counseling faculty here at Fullerton College. Triple SP is a huge funding source for our district, and the need for every student to have a comprehensive educational plan relies primarily on counseling faculty. So I have two questions for you. What is your experience working with counseling faculty with the many mandates and activities within Triple SP? And how do you view counseling faculty's role on campus committees and as part of shared governance? Let me see if I can remember all those components of the questions. But <clears throat> as you know, I have had the opportunity to be both on the instructional side and in the, on the student service side. So, one of the things that I've learned about the Triple SSP, of course, Triple SSP, uh, just for everyone, so we're all on the same page, Student Success Services. That's the first initiative that the state developed to allow, to in fact force institutions, when the students are coming into the institution, to have a plan that really looks at the whole student cycle, the whole student life cycle. So. I have a very good experience. In fact, we, um, I've worked uh, very closely with my Dean of Student Services um, to develop those uh, <clears throat> graduation plans for our students, make sure that the students are oriented, make sure that the students have been assessed and placed, which are the components of the triple SSP, and then making sure that the students have a, a good plan that maps out all the courses they need in order to accomplish their degrees. So I do have a lot of experience doing that. In fact, one of the things that happened when I was hired was within three months of my, my starting my job, my Dean of Student Services left. So I was an acting Dean of Student Services for six months. That gave me a lot of opportunities to work with our counseling and advising staff. And as you know, of course, if I could just digress a little bit, our counseling, our registration admissions and counseling folks, student services in the aggregate, at the window to the institution, right? That's the first place the students get the impression of what the institution is going to look like. So I value and... Uh, um, and respect the job that you guys do at the front end to bring the students to us on the instructional side. That's what I'm, I'm really me talking about here. Uh, obviously, our counseling and advising staff, as I said, are imminently important. Without them, we wouldn't have students being able to develop their educational plans, select the courses they need for their degrees, or be able to have a plan all together of what the students is going to do to get their goals met. Uh, I think counselors um, should be, like all college constituencies, should be part of the decision-making process. They should be involved in all our decision-making processes. We should include them in everything we do. So I don't know how we, we could not have our counseling staff uh, be part of the process. In terms of the value, I know that the ratio of student to counselors is a problem for every institution. 
So if you hire me, the first thing I'll do is talk to the chancellor to see if there is something we can do to increase the ratio of counselors to students. Did I answer your question? I know there are more questions out there. Dr. Mokupu, I'll just say Pete. How about that? It's a great name. Uh, I'm Pete Snyder, the, <laughs> the president of the faculty senate here. And um, <clears throat> we have a very powerful faculty, uh, very accomplished faculty. And <clears throat> uh, I will say that in general, they're, I, I use the expression, not really shrinking violets. Um, <clears throat> they sort of come with a lot of energy and a lot of uh, <coughs> commitment. And so what my question of you is, <coughs> right now they're on their best behavior, of course. But <coughs> my, my question of you is, uh, in the event of conflict re resolution, sorry, in the event of conflict, what would be your procedures or your approach to resolving those type of conflicts with the faculty? Well, thank you. I, you know, as, as, as I mentioned, I came from the academic side of the house, so I can relate. We are all uh, process-oriented, and we were schooled to question everything that uh, is happening, and we never take any unsupported views from anyone. So I can appreciate the culture. Um, having been a faculty, there are two things I've done in all of my life, and I don't know if that's good or bad. I've been a faculty and an administrator. It's all I've ever done. I, I think the, the, the beginning point is whether or not you have a good open communication system in place where people can freely come to you and express their issues and their concerns. I think that's the first thing. Secondly, I think um, when we have crises but we have our eyes on the prize, which is our student success, which is our relationship to one another. You know, we are in a, a, a relationship-based entity. We need each other as a community. We cannot thrive and do the wonderful things that we need to do to transform student lives if we don't get together. So my method is the following. When talking about crises, I, I mean, I could give you a number right now that I'm going through between, you know, folks disagreeing on issues. Listening to folks is the, f is the second thing. Bringing folks together and saying what's going on and listening for a couple of things. Listening for frustration, listening, listening for unmet needs, and then listening for things that may be systemic in the institution and are causing issues between folks. And then being able to um, incentivize folks to, with civility, sit down and objectively talk about issues that they're not happy about. So for me, my conflict resolution style is to listen to one side and listen to the other, and then bring both parties together, because I know the story is always somewhere in between. Um, but. I think as a precedent as well, at least that has worked for me, consistently encouraging people to think about the issues that they are going through in view of the larger picture, right? So if we're going through trying times and we don't agree over issues, we are going through some of those issues about assessment, two schools of thought. Some of our faculty think, you know, this is intrusive, you know, ACCJC is out of its mind. And then there are faculty who say, we should do this. Let's find a way to turn this vice into a virtue. There's something wonderful about being able to talk the same language about assessment across all sections taught by faculty. It's a wonderful way of making sure that students have a common outcome that they, we can all talk about, that they gain from our courses. And so the, the debate goes back and forth. But Reminding people of the larger picture, insisting on civility, and making sure there is open dialogue between folks, 
and then being able to mediate when people cannot agree, but always insist on working together to find solutions to problems and not point fingers and blame. That's my strategy. Okay, I thought I had a loud enough voice. So I'm Danielle Fouquet. I'm the faculty co-chair of the Accreditation Steering Committee. Uh, we are going through the accreditation process right now. And at the same time, our college is embarking on a major um, project to uh, upgrade and renovate uh, and build new buildings. And both of these actually present opportunities to kind of re-envision where we're gonna be in the future so my question is, what would you do as president to make sure that all of those efforts and energies kind of have a common uh, you know, focus on a, a single mission rather than achieving a lot of desperate um, goals? Thank you. Well, we, we are also going through our self-evaluation, and ACCJC will be at the gates next March. So. I, I can relate to the, the process of going through the accreditation process, and at the same time, uh, you have a bond measure. I think maybe that's in part what you're referring to. Uh, for me, first and foremost, folks, the driver is the accreditation I is being reaffirmed. So for me, that's the driver, right? Everything else is subsidiary to that because anything that deviates our attention as an institution from that effort as consequences as you know. If you have never been sanctioned, you may not relate to how difficult it is to be under the yoke of a commission. And at some point in my institution, we were closer to short courts. So nothing should compete whatsoever with our unified singular attention to accreditation. Right. Secondly, I think, I know you have three goals. The district has five strategic goals and you have three goals. Student success, student equity, and community, building community initiatives. So my um, first um, approach would be once we are satisfied that we have in place our accreditation structure, we have a plan, we have deliverables, we have a calendar of deliverables so that we are, we are able to have the, the report 60 days ready to deliver to ACCJC. And we are sure that we are not going to have any more than three recommendations. Then we concentrate on the bond measure and the three strategic goals that we have developed for ourselves to see if we have priorities and action plans to execute those goals. That would be my strategy. I don't know if I answered your question Good morning. Uh, my name is Gabe Torres. I'm a student here at Fullerton College, and I'm also a Marine Corps veteran. My question, or I have two questions. One, what is your experience working with veterans? And two, how do you plan on utilizing that experience to enhance the college experience for veteran students? Yeah, thank you, and by the way, yeah, we thank you for your dedication and sacrifice for us. Y you know, uh, the D.C. area, which is where I was prior to coming to um, VVC, is the biggest um, area with veterans and retired um, uh, veterans. And so I do have a very deep experience working with veterans. In fact, I was just looking at my old um, uh, uh, Internet uh, postings and you know, say confession is it's good for your soul, but terrible for your reputation. Maybe I should stop here. <coughs> but we, uh, at, at the Alexandria campus, which is one of the six campuses that I was referring to, had the largest number of veterans in our programs. And I think the first place for the college is to make sure that we have a space for veterans where they can congregate, get together, because they do have unique experiences and unique situations that sometimes require them to have their, their space. So that's one thing. 
is to have a veteran center, which is just what we have done in my campus a year ago. We developed a veteran center, a space that is uniquely there for the veterans to get together and congregate and talk about issues important to them. Uh, secondly, one of the things that we did when I was a president at the, at the Alexandra campus was we developed a training program where we went to the Marine Corps in this particular case and we went to the Pentagon and we said, what can we do to get cred credentials for all the experiences that veterans bring to the institution? And we actually developed a pathway plan that took prior learning and skills because, as you know, veterans do a lot of stuff, but unfortunately they don't have credentialing in the form of a certificate. So we developed, in fact, a plan in collaboration with George Mason University and Vig the University of Virginia so that veterans came to NOVA and then they finished their AA degree and they transitioned to guaranteed transition to George Mason and George Washington University. So those are some of the things that we've done that I'll be bringing here. I have a lot of networks that I developed when I was a president back in Virginia with the Pentagon, and I would bring some of those resources if we were inclined to take that direction as an institution. Of course, I don't know until I get here. I don't know if I answered your question, sir. Wow, now I'm getting all red and embarrassed. Um, my name is Jean Costello, and I teach English, and I'm the faculty, well, the staff development um, coordinator on campus. And my question for you is, um, what would you do as um, president to foster um, an equitable institution? And so when I say equitable institution, I'm thinking both in terms of equitable for students, in terms of their outcomes, um, but also equitable in terms of how we serve, how we people are represented um, in our campus community as a whole. And, you know, kind of in the context of the, our equity plan, kind of that whole picture of our um, progress towards, um, towards equity as a campus. Thank you. Let me see if I can take a step on, on that. <coughs> well, probably I should begin with a little remark about the student equity part and then see if I can disaggregate this into the, the, the topics that I thought I heard. So obviously the, the student equity plan, as you know, that is a follow-up to the triple SSP, but that is much more earmarked on the instructional side of the house. As you know, initially the triple SSP funding really concentrated on the students as they come in transitioning from high schools and coming into the institution. This, the student equity side looks at the disproportionate impact, namely which groups in the institution are not doing as well as whatever your benchmark group is, and what reasons explain why there is an achievement gap between those groups, right? It also emphasizes the role of faculty in the student equity plan. So the triple SSP is on the student side of the house at the entry level. The uh, student equity is supposed to now integrate student triple SSP and the academic side of the house in terms of the impact that pedagogy plays in helping students succeed. So one of the things that I would do if you hired me as a president is look at your student equity plan and then see if in fact you have developed a mechanism where all those pieces that impact student success have been identified and we have a plan for how we are going to execute that. So let me give you an example. One of the problems we have in my institution, challenges we have in my institution right now is that <coughs> we, we have been trying to get, uh, incentivize as many faculty as possible to work with our student services side of the house to develop some of these uh, uh, systems to help with the learning communities. Let me just tell you what we are doing. So one of the things we are looking at is learning communities because we know from longitudinal research that 
learning communities are the best way of helping students bond with the institution, move forward as a cohort, and complete their courses. But our faculty have come forward and said, look, I, I teach. I spend most of my time with my student preparing my lesson plan, doing research about how to be an effective teacher. If I wanted to participate in this effort, what sorts of things are at my disposal that I can look at and begin to do? Right? So one of the things we're looking at is we've partnered with this entity from Washington, D.C. that specializes on conducting research on best practices from across the nation. And we brought them to our campus and we said, we want you to help us identify those best practices that have been identified across the nation, whether through the Achieving the Dream, the Lumina Foundation, the Aspen Institution, Institute, rather. And then we want you to aggregate all those resources and bring them to us so our faculty have something that they can look at and begin to, to think about how they participate. Now I know I digress from one of your questions. <laughs> um, and then equity in general, and, and I think that was one component of your question. So equity in general, whether it's between our students, our employees, our faculty, and all stakeholders in the institution is imminently important. No single person or group of people should feel like they have no equal access to resources and support from the institution. I don't know if I answered your question, ma'am. How you doing? My name is Brian Crooks, and I uh, teach uh, PE here, and um, also assistant football coach. So we have a huge tradition of success of students in the classroom transferring on, and a huge success on the athletic fields also. It's only been going for over 100 years. And uh, my question to you is, what's your perspective on physical education and athletics, and what role do you think it plays in overall education? Thank you, Coach. I, I uh, you know, I used to be a boxer. I was a professional boxer for 15 years, so I have a bias for PE to start with. Um, you know, our student athletes, of course, are students first, right? They're student first and athletes last. Uh, I absolutely support athletic programs. Just in, I, I'm talking just on the sports side of the house, not not PE yet, and I think. When the institution has a good plan of integrating athletic programs, and you have a good plan of helping those students be successful, there is no public relations mechanism you can get other than our uh, athletic program. In fact, one day I was visiting here just to get acquainted with the institution, and I visited a couple of places. I went to the uh, social science division, and I went to the machines and and printing shop there, a wonderful part-time faculty welcomed me and walked me through the printing. But there was a baseball uh, um, game that was going on that I remember looking at one of the banners saying, once a hornet, always a hornet. So I, I, I support athletic programs. I think they're a very good mechanism for uh, enro attracting students to our institution. And I think they're also a wonderful opportunity to bring students sometimes who would not access education but they can through our athletic programs um, so I'm in full support I love what you do I believe in PE what else can I say good morning uh, I'm Sharon Kelly and I'm the president of classified Senate here at Fullerton College um, and classified here at Fullerton College are very dedicated to their jobs and very hardworking. Um, and sometimes because of this, they don't um, take the opportunity or the time to participate in shared governance. Um, we um, took a survey last year um, of classified staff to find that um, the main reasons that classified weren't participating in shared governance is because um, they were too busy on their job or that their supervisors wouldn't, didn't support them in participating on shared governance committees. As um, president, what could you do or what would you do to encourage classified participation in shared governance? Thank you. You know, um, classified staff 
are the engine that runs the institution, right? We, they, they, they do all the work that enables our faculty to provide quality education and quality programs. They are the engine that enables our students to register, to get into the classroom so that our faculty are able to work with them. So I just want to know, I, I recognize the imminence and the importance of our classified folks. So I, I'm going to have a, a rather very short response. We have to have a mechanism by which our classified folks participate in the process. We have to make the opportunities for them to participate in the governance and the shared governance process. We have, by the way, similar problems where we are. And what we've done is we've just told the managers that you have to make an allowance for classified folks to participate in the governance structure. Right now we are going through accreditation, as I said. We wanted to make sure that we had full representation from all college constituents group students, classified, and of course our faculty. So what I would do is to get together with my leadership and say, what strategy can we come up with to make sure that our classified folks have opportunities to participate in the system? I don't know if I answered your question. Oh, thank you. Went fast. I, I, I started uh, by talking a little bit about why I am in this wonderful institution called the Community College. And I talked a little bit about the value, the transformative value, and the immediacy of things we do in transforming individuals and communities. Uh, I talked a little bit about uh, the fact that I started on the instructional side of the house and I've had the opportunity to work on both sides, student services and instruction. Then I've had the opportunity to be a president, which has given me the opportunity to make a little more impact because I'm, I was in the position to work with all constituencies to make things happen for our student success programs. My credentials and my experience, as I've said, is impeccable, is broad and deep. I've been a faculty, I've been a dean, a vice president, a president, an executive vice president. I'm sure you're wondering, how did you move from being a president to executive vice president? But I'll leave that to you. Um, <clears throat> um, I think that I not only have the credentials, the experience, but I think it is in the things I've been able to do by bringing people together, establishing consensus and getting things done on behalf of the students. I talked a little bit about our pathway grant. I talked about uh, some of the initiatives that I've been part of, both at the national level, that have been a testament to the importance and the impact that the community college system has. In 2011, we developed a partnership with the American Association of Community Colleges, the Aspen Institute, the Jobs for the Future, and the USID and ACE, American Council on Education. We got $5 million to go to South Africa and provide training for institutions that wanted to adopt the community college system. Why am I mentioning that? It is because what we do as a community college system, and as pa particularly as Fullerton College, we make so much difference that the rest of the world has realized. If you want to move your folks to middle class life, you have to establish a sound educational system that moves people from poverty into middle class life by giving them credentials which we know today if you don't have a college credential, you're not going to have a livable wage. You're never going to access the American dream. You're never going to live the middle class life. I've done all those things by working with faculty staff and my leaders to come up with some of the most transformative systems that have impacted communities at the national level and international level. And I bring that experience and network to you, and I'm, I think I'm the best man that you should have for, this pres for the president position. Lastly, I share your values and principles. I share your values on student concentration on student success, quality teaching, small classes, 
small and tight communities, and academic rigor that transforms students into better citizens who make a difference in their families and their societies. Thank you very much.